are back again. Week six. Back like we never left. How are you ladies feeling today? Hey, everybody. Good. What's up? Pretty good? Yes, that's what I like to hear. Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are back for week six of That's What She Said. We'll get these intros out of the way and we will keep this thing pumping. I am Kaylani Blackwell. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Women in Real Estate, a national platform designed to empower women and uh, minorities, giving them access to uh, information, events, networks to help them shorten their learning curve, build wealth for themselves and their families. Shout out to the Wire crew. Shout out to the Wire crew. I see you guys every week, every time uh, in the comments for showing. Thank you guys for showing up consistently. Uh, we'll go ahead and move down the line. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Patty Goodspeed. I've been a mortgage banker for 21 years. I've been speaking on the economy since everything shifted in 2022. I'm excited to be here and let's talk. That's what's up. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Lady J right here in Dallas, Texas. I'm a media personality, a real estate investor. And look, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. So, you yeah, <laughs> know, let's get it. <laughs> yes, let's yes, it. yes. And I am Nasima, straight out of Oakland, California. Always going to represent labor and delivery nurse, personal finance enthusiast, here to normalize Black wealth. Nasima, you look gorgeous. And not that you don't, yes. you yes. already have great skin, but you came through with the, <laughs> the lashes today. You should be said, I'm outside. Oh it's almost eight. This seems to look Listen, like who I you got a date it. with afterwards. We need to get in your business. I, I have before a date with start. nobody. First of all, I have to <laughs> look like something every time I come in front of you guys because, like, half the time I look dead. So, like, I was rushing to like put on <laughs> lashes. I was like, oh my god, I'm not gonna be looking crazy today. <laughs> you, look you look amazing yes you do thank you okay so, so i want to give everybody a quick rundown before we get into this gig today um we are going to do a, a very quick market update we i wasn't going to include this for today but it's pretty significant patty and i have already been on two calls today we're going to give a quick market update for folks we're going to get into two business related entrepreneurial topics and then we're going to save the juicy jade's hot topic uh, for the end per usual but we're gonna switch things up we got a little bit of a timer we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna try to cover a lot of ground in a very short time so just giving you guys a, a heads up that that's what's going on today so patty what what the interest rates went up today and for you to put that in your newsletter to warn everybody and let everybody know which i believe a couple days ago you were telling everybody hey you need a lock you've been calling the plays like crazy what happened in the last 24 48 hours yeah i mean what happened is exactly what we expected to happen the cpi report came in uh 0.2 percent higher than expectations um there are lots of expectations across the board from various financial institutions inflation is up inflation is up for the third month in a row and mm -hmm. so in the grand scheme of things the market I mean, the reaction to the market almost feels just like, like, how are you surprised by this, right? We all knew it was coming. Last week's job report, before the big job report came out on Friday, we had an ADP report. And I think everyone listening would be pretty familiar with what ADP is because it's a massive payroll company. And they have a, they, they work through a big portion of many of the corporations that exist. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way to measure what's happening in, in, in unemployment. And they gave an indication, even the ADP report had new job creations coming in higher than expectations at a with a significant margin. So that was kind of a prelude to what we knew was going to come on Friday. So I locked all of the loans that I could prior to Friday's report, knowing that there would be a hike, there would be a bump in rates. So what does that mean? That means that if the, if the Fed's job is to cut rates in order to stimulate the economy, but the economy is boasting a lot of brand new jobs being created. No one on this panel who's business, we are all entrepreneurs, any, every single one of us would not be posting a job opening unless we were earning the revenue to be able to do so. So when there's all these job openings, if you think about it from that perspective, you'll understand that that means the economy is doing well. People are making money. People are spending money. New jobs are being created. It's a sign that inflation is going to continue to rise because as people are working and earning, they'll continue to spend money and demand for goods and services remains high. So the Federal Reserve is looking for weakness in the economy in the labor spec, uh, sector. And also they're looking to see inflation numbers go in the other direction, go down. They want it to go closer to 2%. And that's not happening. So jobs continue to get created. 
the unemployment rate continues to go down. And then we have inflation being really sticky and now on the rise for three months in a row. These are the indicators that the Federal Reserve is looking for to have some sort of basis to cut rates. Well, if you take that away from them, what's left? Nothing. Um, so the so today's CPI report came in hot. It came in higher than usual. And that sends a signal to the market that the Fed can't cut rates. As of yesterday, there was a 56% chance of a rate cut in June. And as of right now, that, that probability is down to 16%. For some perspective, in January, there was a 90% chance of a rate cut in March. And that went down to 9% by obviously late February. So these expectations is like a big fat crap game on the side of the road, right? It's all a bet. It's a bet on what the Fed will do. And those bets are definitely making a difference in the market and interest rates. So remember, I've said this so many times for anyone who's listening here that's heard me talk about this elsewhere, is that last year when interest rates peaked over 8%, that was because the market was betting that there would be a hike in 2023. So as soon as concerns and fears for a hike were removed off the table, interest rates went from 8.03% down to the mid to low 6% range, sparking massive demand that hit the market, bringing lots of momentum in going into the new year and lots of excitement. So here we are in April, there was a 90% chance of a rate, rate cut in March, that didn't happen. And now the chances of a cut in June are going from 56% down to 16%. And the average 30 year fix went from 6.975% up to 7.34% today. So what happens is the biggest impact is going to be on the psychology of a buyer who's in the market right now, worried about paying a buyer's agent, worried about higher costs and worried about inflation. So it's really not good news for the real estate industry. It's not good news for the American people because they need to get control of prices. People in general have a different sentiment than what is being presented through the administration currently in term and what's being kind of, um, promoted as Bidenomics. Hey, the economy's growing. Inflation is going down. I did this. I did that. The truth is inflation has not improved since the Biden administration has been in office and money printing is the number one source of inflation. So something I'd like to point out and what leads to moments like this is that over $5 trillion was printed out of thin air and pumped into the economy during COVID. Right. So now they're trying to reel that back in. And the tightening that they've done has been to the tune of one point five trillion dollars. So if I put five trillion dollars into the economy and I slowly take back one point five trillion, that's really not enough to put a dent in inflation. And they know that. So right now we're all basically just spectators in a big show that we really don't know what's going on behind the scenes for. So my advice to the people listening is that if you're looking to purchase a home, the fact remains that real estate is an asset that has the element of scarcity and tight lending conditions mean less sellers coming off the rates that they have right now, tighter inventory and more stable values. The best thing that can happen for interest rates today is the idea of a recession entering back into the conversation and having actual legitimate facts to get there because that would drive rates down, add more inventory and help pick up activity in real estate. So I don't want you to be afraid of those terms that get tossed around into the news. I also want you to know that if you're looking to buy a house and you can afford to buy a house at a higher interest rate, it's a good idea to do so. It's always a good idea to buy real estate. The best time to buy real estate was yesterday. The best time to buy real estate was 10 years ago. It's just like planting a tree. The best time to do it was back when you should have first thought about it, right? So buying a house is not an issue. Affordability is a major concern and it's not a new concern because the cost of homes have continued gone up since the early 1900s. So if you want to buy a house, don't get discouraged, but just make sure that you're buying within your means. And I'd like to highlight that if you are looking at any data and statistics that is reiterating the fact that home prices are going down, I want you to understand that that data is relative to new builds. And it's not because the home prices are going down. It's because more buyers are gravitating towards smaller and lower priced homes, driving the average price down when they're doing the math on what's being sold. You have to understand the details of those headlines. So home prices are not only stable, but in many markets continue to rise because demand is high in comparison to supply. And this particular situation with rates going not only gets a few buyers onto the sidelines and, and maybe a fearful reaction, but it also gets sellers off the sidelines and keeps inventory super low. So we have to watch closely. 
Be super, super vigilant about how you share this information. If you're a real estate professional, don't run with the headlines because 99% of real estate agents I'm familiar with through, through social media started out this year by posting that the Federal Reserve promised six rate cuts this year. And I was adamantly against that. So I want you to be super careful about the headlines that you share and understand the details. And for more information, you can join me on April 18th on my webinar, The Truth Behind the Headlines, which is at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we can throw the link in the chat and that's all I got for you. I love how Patty like never like messes with the sensationalism. She's like all facts. Okay. <laughs> like let's not play. <laughs> like if you can afford to buy a house, buy a house. Like don't let the lines fool you. And I think that's what a lot of our society is driven by is all this clickbaity, um, uh, like really microwave kind of fast culture and not really processing and thinking about long-term impacts of things. But not only that, I think like we are um, like trying to like always have like some kind of instant gratification and in thinking that um, like now is the best time or, you know, or there won't ever be another time. But I think that it talk it speaks to like our next topic, um, which is instant gratification, right? And I, there's this quote by Mar um, Malcolm Gladwell that suggests that it takes 10,000 hours to master a specific skill. However, you know, like we're so obsessed with instant gratification and overnight success. Um, I think it's important for us to talk about, especially like in seeing the gems that Patty dropped, like, and mm -hmm. we know that she's all about her stuff and she's super successful. Like, how long did it take for you guys to become successful? Okay, so I'm gonna start our our timer for this for this question, and I love this mm -hmm. question because I th love how you related that to the overnight success from investing in home ownership, but also from a perspective of like Patty's been in this business for 20 years, and that's right. why she can speak the way that she speaks. So I'm gonna throw this timer up. Let's work backwards. Let or well, no. I'll, how about I start? We'll go down the line each a minute and then we'll, you know, open up the dialogue. Uh, so I'll start with myself. My minute will go. So how long did it take to become uh, successful? So first of all, that that book by um, Malcolm Gladwell is a huge 10,000 hours to become a master at something. And I remember uh, what this takes me back to is being a hooper. Now, I was a tomboy. OK, when I was younger, I grew up in the gym, eight years old, playing in the Nike League. My dad was my coach my whole life. And he always used to say to me, like, you have to apply yourself. You're only going to be as good as you apply yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I learned some fundamental like character building skills at a very young age and being done with this overnight success, you know, thought process is, is it, it boggles my mind, but it's more true now than it's ever been. So my minute is already almost over and I didn't say anything. <laughs> this is, it, it's taken me. Uh, over three years to build the current company that I uh, run today. It has taken me almost 10 years in the real estate business to become as knowledgeable as I am today. And it's taken me a lifetime of working with people to, to, to add to the sum total of the person I have also become today. So um, I also want to highlight that the average age, since we're all entrepreneurs of an entrepreneur um, that has run a start, that has started a successful startup, that start age is 45 years old. So I want to make sure that we add some context here that overnight success is, is not, it takes a lifetime. So, okay, I'm going to be off my minute and I'll pass it to Patty to go ahead and answer that question. Well, if you think about 10,000 hours and you divide that by five years, it's about 40 hours a week. So they usually say an overnight success usually takes 10 years because you don't give, a, you don't care about somebody's success until they're successful. You don't care about the process and you don't care about the journey. You only pay attention to the story when you start seeing the big numbers and the accolades, right? Yeah. So like, you don't know what it was like for me. You didn't care about who I was when I was sitting on my, on my living room floor with nothing going through a divorce. And I was sitting in my closet making phone calls. You have no idea what that was like because you didn't, you don't care. You just care that I do a hundred million dollars and that I'm one of the top 100 women in the country, right? That's what's attractive to you. If I was the one who was sitting in my room broke and I was making phone calls out of my dark 
dark closet and I was wondering how I was going to pay my mortgage, then you would, then that would be a whole different story, right? So that's, I think if you take the 10,000 hours and you divide that over five years and you understand that that's a 40 hour week, five years in a row, then you can understand what that means about the 10,000 hours. It takes time to learn. I remember when I started and had no idea what the word mortgage meant. I had a book the size of an encyclopedia with names and phone numbers and I had to call them. I didn't understand how a mortgage was attached to a house. I didn't understand that it was a secured loan. I had no idea what the word meant and it took years for it to click. So I think the idea that 10,000 hours creates the success and the expertise is because you're going to have aha moments because you're in the process of gathering information and you might feel like you don't know what you're doing. That's where imposter syndrome comes from. So you feel this imposter syndrome because you don't know what you're doing because you're learning as you go. And then as things start to click, it makes sense. And you wake up and it's five years later and you've, you've accomplished significant milestones within your career or your goal path. So that's the idea. It's about consistency. The only thing that successful people have figured out that you haven't yet is that they didn't quit. The amount of times that you have to quit and start over, it's like refinancing prematurely. You're restarting the term of your loan. You're restarting the terms of the agreement that you made for yourself every time you quit and start over. The key is don't put the book back on the shelf. Just knock out one page at a time. Wake up five years later and realize that you were capable of everything you thought you couldn't do. So I'm going to piggyback on Patty. I'm so glad that you broke those numbers down because I think that what that what that says, um, and I'm so glad, Kaylana, you said, you know, most successful businesses are people that are 45 years old or older, right? When you put it into context like that, it it allows people to give themselves grace. You know, we are on social media all the time. You got the 21-year-old that's in the big mansion. You got the 18-year-old that's showing the $50 million. You, you know, so you're constantly on this hamster wheel feeling like you have to catch up. Um, we do need to bring the humanness back in humanity. You know, one of my sayings is like delay gratification to me is one of the most underrated keys to being successful in life is understanding the concept of delayed gratification right and it's just completely opposite than what our society you know is is built around right now so i'm new in the real estate industry and i'm constantly beating myself up because i'm like patty when she started you know trying to learn this terminology that for me oftentimes sounds like a foreign language um because i feel like i'm on a hamster wheel but it is my tribe. It is the people around me that encourage me and remind me, hey, I got 20 years ahead of you. Hey, I've been doing this for 15 years. Like I am way ahead of you because I have had time. I've had the 10,000 hours. Me coming from the world of radio, breaking it down into a 40 hour a week for five years, I would say that is actually spot on as far as gaining your level of expertise. But in life, even when you become an expert, even when you become really great at something, to me, one of the things to remember is we have to always remain teachable. And that's what I love about every lady on this, this show is that we are very successful in what we do or what we have done. But we are always learning. We are always sharpening our tool belt. We are always reading. We are always wanting to get better. And it's not necessarily from people that are ahead of us. We learn from everybody around us. So that's my, that's my two cents. I, I, I love the numbers and the way you guys broke that down. We have to give ourselves grace. Yes, so yes, good, yes. Jade. That lateral, that lateral learning is super important. Um, but what um, I want to talk about overnight success as far as like in the personal finance space, I could talk about nursing as well, because that's really big for me, too. But in the personal finance space, like I have a really clickbaity story of paying off a million dollars in three years. And it seems like, oh, my God, like that's really, really fast. But in the in the trenches of it, nobody wants to really hear about the fact that during that time I went from being a single mom to being um, in an, an abusive marriage to going through a tumultuous divorce, um, all of the ups and downs that I had to go through. And um, for me, it did not seem overnight, right? It was that just putting one foot in front of the other and just keep on moving that, that consistency that Patty talked about. Um, 
And so when people like see things on social media where they see me have um, these massive um, uh, successes in like reels or something, it's because my social media, if you scroll back, it's so, 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 so old. And since 2016, I've been putting in the work. I have been sharing my story. I have been saying these things for a long, long, long time. And so um, I think uh, a lot of times, you know, social media is a highlight reel. I did a whole post on that, that it's not real and that there's a lot of um, hardship behind um, the successes that you see. Um, but we only want to live in the light of these people. And we don't understand that in order to get there, there was a huge testimony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that reminds me of when you see someone's kid on social media, and all of a sudden, it's their eighth birthday. And you're like, shit, I you were pregnant just two weeks ago. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's where when you see someone and you see the big post, you're like, Oh, wow, that happened overnight. Well, no, it didn't. You just didn't care about the post I made at midnight two weeks ago when I was crying because of I was sick and tired of life, you know. <laughs> right. So yeah, that's what that reminds me of the definitely the journey is real. Yeah, I feel like so many people because of this viral culture, right? So many people try to do things to go viral, right? Mm -hmm. And those are very lightning in a bottle moments. And I think what is what we have to learn to accept is that the shortcut is really the long way, right? Mm -hmm. These very fast ways of doing things, right? They might yeah. get you kind of interim, you know, progress, but the the way to actually get it done is to be in the trenches, like you said, Nasima. And so one of the things that I think is super interesting is, is that when you are really, everything that you experience in your life uh, adds to who you become, every experience, right? And yeah. a lot of these skills are transferable. So Jade, you talked about being new in real estate and you might be learning a whole new world of real estate, but you are not a new businesswoman. Right. And so you have learned things that, you know, you've told your your testimony and your story publicly um, a lot, even on here about your journey in media and in radio and all of the things that you went through that you had to learn from that seed have helped you understand your value and what you bring to the table today. And as well as, you know, the brand that you've created in addition to all of those things. So I think, you know, moral of the story when it comes to you know, being an overnight success is, man, and, and I don't know, I don't know how we feel. I don't know how the culture feels about Will Smith these days. I haven't been tapped in, but his book is really good. And in the intro, in the introduction of the book, he talks about how his father made him and his brother build a wall. And it took them, he felt what felt like a year to build a brick wall. I don't remember where it's at, outside their house or outside their shop or something. And that they would come home from school every single day. And before they could do anything, they had to contribute mm -hmm. to laying these bricks. And mm -hmm. that at the end of the year, they looked back and said, oh my gosh, we built an entire wall. But when you're wow. laying the bricks every single day, you don't realize that wow. that is what you're doing. Yeah, And so... I mean, goodness, all of the skills, everything that contributes to who you are today. And when you get tired, man, just just wake up and say, only focus on laying that brick and just trust that by the time you get up and you turn around, there will be a wall there built for for you. Which right? is good. It sounds effort. like you're like it's like there's pain in the process. Right. It's almost like when you're trying to get a six pack or when you're trying to, you know, get your body together or whatever, you're going to the gym it hurts you know you have sore muscles it, it really is it is a it is a constant you know for me um one of my and i i the reason why i'm not good at celebrating in the moment but it is because what people's perception of me scares me sometimes like I'll be posting on social media and tell me if you guys can re relate to this and and I, we'll transition actually into marketing and branding because I guess because I have built a brand over the years and I'm good at marketing myself, especially for other opportunities. People have this perception when they see certain things and I'll just use social media and they'll say, oh, you doing your thing. And I'm thinking to myself, I am struggling, right? And it, it, it's not a struggle because we're all blessed, but I'm just saying what people perceive to be yeah. success and what you perceive to be success. So you're constantly fighting this battle against perception and what reality really is. You get what I'm saying? Because in order for us to do what we do well, 
we have to be consistent in building brands. We have to be good marketers because that's the world that we live in, right? But it is really scary when people think like, oh, you popping, you know? Think about it, Patty. You brought up the fact that you've been doing this for 21 years. You know, you've done $100 million worth. That's clickbait type headlines. Nasima for you as well. But Nasima, I saw you put up a post the other day that I absolutely loved. It's like, don't think that I don't still struggle with my finances sometimes. Like I'm not healed and whole and out of this. <laughs> right. But people perceive that you got rid of a million dollars worth of debt. So now you have to be rolling in a dough. No, you have to continue with those disciplines. Otherwise, you we all fall right back into all the things. Am I right? Wrong? I don't know. Right. No, you are, you are right. I think you said something super critical about the pain. And I, I, I only want to add this and of course, pass it right back to you, Nasima. I think when the two examples we had was being new in a career, let's talk specifically real estate. The painful process is showing up to an open house four times a week, picking up and calling expired listings as if your life depended on it to get an opportunity to go get more listings. If I know a lady who's 62 years old in Oakland, California, who's the, one of the top listing agents in the market, like one of the top 10 in the entire market, her husband knows not to walk into her office between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. daily because that's when she's prospecting. That woman is 62 years old, mm. and I can promise you she's not hurting for a meal. But that discipline is the 10,000 hours we're talking about. Mm. So the painful success is you don't need another class. You don't need another course. You don't need another show. You don't need another book. What you need is to go sit behind closed doors for four hours, completely uninterrupted, completely undistracted and face the painful facts of rejection and make call after call after call. Call the listing agent and say, can I do an open house for you? If you committed to doing four open houses a week for the next eight months, your business won't grow. Your paycheck won't increase. I'll bet you $10,000 that it will. And then when it comes to debt, if you just take an Excel spreadsheet and you go through your three last credit card statements for the last 90 days, if mm. you don't find $5,000 that you wasted in blue without even thinking about it or recognizing it and sit with that pain, you're not ready to live a debt-free life. You're not ready for financial security. That's the pain Jade's talking about. That's the mm -hmm. 10,000 hours. It's sitting with the ugly facts that you don't want to face, that big pile of laundry that you don't want to deal with, and just getting through it. <laughs> And that's what we mean when we say we continue to go through that struggle because that process of purification is ongoing. You don't graduate. Stop yeah. yelling at the people, Patty. God damn. No, they, they, we need, we, girl, we need <laughs> to be yelled it. at because let it's me good. tell you. Oh, so good. I did tell myself I was going to stop talking like that. I'm trying. <laughs> no, but it's a passion, right? You mean it. You care. There is pain in discipline. Discipline is the hard part. Everybody keeps saying learning the information is the hard part. No, it's the discipline. It's me getting off social media because I thought I was going to scroll for five minutes. And next thing I know, it was three hours. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, where has the day gone? Yes, the discipline is the hard part. You you better pass the plate for Patty. Okay. <laughs> Patty always picking up an offering on this show, boy. <laughs> And then now for the record, Jay, that's when a TikTok shop, that's when a TikTok shop got you for sure in those three hours. 100%. That's when, it, you know, and I ain't been back on TikTok since I bought all that stuff. I'm not yet. Congratulations. Because yeah. Patty started yelling. Go. I'm like, I ain't going to do it anymore. Right. <laughs> You're going to hear my voice now when you go shopping. Exactly. She, I'm like, oh God, I got to pull my credit card statement and start highlighting and see where I wasted. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Let's get into it. Let's talk about branding versus marketing. Um, mm -hmm. I think every lady on here has had the experience. Um, let, let Tell us about what you feel your brand is. And Kaylani, I really want to toss this to you because you did something extraordinary when Clubhouse was out and you've had to continue to build this brand new brand. And I'll say brand new to the world, right? It's something that you've always done, but you've had to build this brand mm -hmm. and you are a really great marketer like you think of all the things you know all the details so i really want you to kind of take this for a second and then we'll start kind of chiming in on it okay well you know gosh i preach this a lot this is for all of my wire members that are here and in the chat and commenting i appreciate you guys being here i probably sound like a broken record to these women because i am constantly Thank you so much, LaToya, saying that Wire is an amazing brand. I am constantly preaching this concept of branding yourself. Before Wire even became a thing, I realized that my personal brand is what helped me navigate corporate commercial real estate. Um, 
the best possible way. So I know we're not talking about we, you know, overnight success can't be a thing. But if you want to really shorten that time frame and shorten that learning curve, re you really need to focus on your personal brand. Um, when I did that and created an audience of my own a brand messaging of my own, even the largest corporate commercial firm in the world had to say something about it. Like, hey, mm -hmm. wait a minute, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. This this business development it, it transcends way past a, co a commercial deal. It mm -hmm. transcends into boardrooms, meeting rooms, networking events. You know, when you go to meet somebody, it should be always very, very clear who you are, what you represent and what you stand for. Mm -hmm. You know, your brand is really, really big. And so I learned that in navigating that world. And so in creating Wire, I have to, I cannot take any credit. Wire was and is a God thing. I speaking of the idea that what you learn in your life sticks with you, I had no idea when I made the logo for Wire that it was going to be as recognizable as it's become today. I had no idea that our pastel colors that I thought just looked cool in the moment, I thought it was simple, uh, feminine, easy to recognize, right? Our triangle logo, there was there was a, a, strat a thought behind it, right? There's a concept behind it. It's a triangle, holy trinity, good things comes in, come in threes, right? It's downward pointing, divine feminine, right? I was thinking like that, not realizing that, you know, that every brand needs to be palatable and digestible too, right? And the brand messaging should be very, very clear. Th it was a God thing. So when Wire, when we, you know, we went viral on Clubhouse, we created the club. I had no idea it was going to be what it, it turned out to be. And I'm just so grateful that in, you know, hindsight, I had the wherewithal to kind of incorporate and do some of these things that have become the brand that everybody knows today as Wire. So um, can't take any credit. It's a God thing. But what I would say, I heard this video on I think it was on TikTok. I don't even know. I wish I knew who the creator. I would love to credit the creator for this. But it said, if you think about, you know, a hotel business, if Nike were to create a hotel, which is random, you could guess what that experience would be like. Oh, yeah. If Marriott were to create a hotel, I mean, create a shoe. I'm sorry. Trying to create a shoe. I don't know what the heck this shoe would be like. Right. right? That's the power of branding so um i'm gonna say this and i'll get off the soapbox you know your brand is the it's the essence and the soul behind your marketing right you can market anything i could market this white tissue that i was waving around when patty was cussing us out and you know i could have you know it's functional it's good i can sell i can market this to you but the kleenex brand is what you know transcends so it's the heart and the soul behind what you do and it really starts with building your business on a solid foundation being clear as to who you are who you're here to serve and that should be that should never be a question when you are interacting with someone or when they are interacting or discovering you on any platform whether that be an email social media a, a, an event it shouldn't matter um and i'm gonna go ahead and park that there thank you for asking me that question can, can I chime in on the branding part? I think we also have to bring up the fact that what your brand is should be authentic to who you are. Oftentimes we want to see ourselves a certain way and that's not how everybody else is seeing us. Um, so if you are trying to be somebody else, mm -hmm. it will not translate over eventually, right? You can only fake it for so long. So we have all been given a gift, right? Kehlani, the reason why Wire is working for you because you are authentically operating in the gift that God has given you, right? And it just, it just shows like you're not faking it. Like this, the, the topics that you you speak on and you pouring into women, it's who you authentically are, right? And for every other lady that is on here as well. So remember, if you're, and here's the thing, not often, there's often times when people don't know what their brand is. What should my brand be? I would make a recommendation, send out three to five questions to the people that are closest to you, right? And ask them, when you think of me or when you think of what I do, give me some words that describe me. And, you know, like find out information about what people's perception is of you. It doesn't mean that's what you have to go with per se. If you want that perception to be different, then you need to change how you come off to people, right? If you want a different brand, because you do start branding with your closest friends, like your brand, like the way your friends and your family describe you is probably very similar to what your authentic brand is now. Again, I'm not saying that that can't adjust, 
But I just think authenticity, people real recognize is real. And we live in a society where everybody's faking nowadays. And so if you want your brand to be long lasting, I would strongly recommend it be something that you're truly passionate about. I remember um, this was a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'm randomly in the shower and I, I'm not one of those people that says, you know, God said, but I just feel like it was something over me. And I remember God saying, stop chasing the bag, chase me and the bag will come. Right. Mm. And it's been something that I, I say that it's been very hard for me to do because I've habitually over my life hustled. Right. And mm-hmm. so I find myself chasing the bag. Then I have to scale myself back and be like, OK, my focus is off. I got to put my focus on him and not on necessarily money. And that's when things kind of start happening. So it's a constant up and down for me. But I say all that to say, make sure your brand is who God has made you to be, not you trying to get the bag because that's the fad at the time. So that's that's Amen. my two cents on branding. Yeah, I wasn't prepared for today's episode. My God, this is so good. So good. Ms. Nima, were you about to say something? I was just reading this question um, by Nicole that says, I love how you say that brands have to be palatable. Are minority brands palatable? Um, why do I feel like as soon as, as ethnicity is, is, is introduced, it's less palatable to the masses? Am I bugging? Mm. And um, my whole uh, thought process around that is that you don't have to be for everyone. Um, people are going to find you and follow you, especially if you're true to who you are. Um, my brand is heavily um, centered around Black women, mothers, nurses, right? But my the people who follow me and people who can relate to me span across every demographic out there. Um, and so I don't think that by introducing ethnicity, you're watering down, you know, your brand or who you are. Um, you guys may or may not agree, but just personally, I just feel like when it, when you cut, when it comes to like marketing and branding, like you always have to look at like who your avatar is, focus on that person, speak to them. And then other people will kind of um, fall into place, (laughs) you know, so to say, Mm -hmm. so to speak, but you have to have a person in mind, even if that person is yourself that you're speaking to, you, you can't be speaking to everyone and be effective. Mm -hmm. That's right. Finding the avatar is definitely important. Mm -hmm. I have Mm -hmm. a comment on that. So if I may, because I know that, you know, I'm not black and, um, I'm Middle Eastern, I'm, I'm Persian, I'm a woman, I'm not, I'm not black. And I think that that conversation is different sometimes. But one of my best friends, my sister, she is a black real estate broker and she's really successful. She makes a million dollars a year in commissions. And she did that while she had a job that a lot of people don't even know about. So she mm. was, she had such a strong limiting belief um, about race and expanding her business that she couldn't let go of the nine to five job that she had because of the pension she was going to get. And when she finally did, it really helped increase her income significantly. One of the biggest shifts that were made is that I introduced her to a brokerage where two of the top producers were also black, a $2 million brokerage in an extremely white neighborhood um, with a community of other Asians that would also be perceived as highly racist. And the two top producers within that $2 billion organization were also black and far less experienced than she was. And it helped. So I think that race is an issue. It's always an issue. I always say everybody's racist. People are racist. Like it's a fact, right? You're not going to remove that. But I think if sometimes we remove whatever limiting belief it is, and like Nasima said, focus on the demographic, then you can make it easier to build the base and then grow from there. Because regardless of various factors, I think when you're branding and when you're marketing, you're still, you have a target audience. Your product isn't for everybody. Your brand isn't for everybody. Your service isn't for everybody. So I think narrowing that focus is help is helpful. And then just the removal of the limiting belief is that the people you are meant to target are going to want to consume what you have to offer, mm-hmm. regardless of other limitations. The only other short note on branding and marketing I wanted to contribute is that if you think of marketing as a sales pitch and you think of branding as a reputation, you can understand the difference. Don't get caught up in constant marketing to create revenue in the short term while neglecting the art of building that long term reputation. 
right? So branding is reputation and marketing is a sales pitch. Mm, so Patty, good. we're not going to keep playing with you. Okay. You're not going to keep <laughs> taking <laughs> all the, all, we not, we can't keep passing this plate. Oh, I mean, God. seriously, I'm telling y'all, y'all, y'all <laughs> mark my words. I hope y'all are recording this. Patty is going to be on somebody CNN, MSNB, <laughs> something, something soon. Nothing. Watch. <laughs> Yeah. I'm I hope it's you. yours. As long as it's your platform, I'll be there. You're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to switch gears real fast. Um, hot topic isn't anything juicy today. There's two things I'm going to sneak in that I do want to talk about. But first, I have to ask everybody on here. I know we're tired of the topic, but can we please talk about the solar eclipse that happened this week? Did y'all see it where you were? Like, could you see it? Because I'm in Texas. Y'all didn't get a chance to see it? I was definitely I didn't. taking it out. I was, uh, I'm normally, well, I'm not in Columbus, Ohio and the eclipse. I mean, it was in direct path of the eclipse. So I literally, all of my family, all of my friends is all over my social media and I'm in Vegas right now. And so we oh. didn't get the same, we didn't get, I'm sad. It was Okay. Cause I super cool. downplayed it. I'm in Texas. I was like, who, who cares about a solar eclipse until I was outside at 1 15 and literally it got pitch black outside. It was the craziest thing. I really felt like I was in a movie. So we're going to move on from that since y'all went in Texas, but just know. <laughs> Anybody that I called and I said, why are y'all having these watching parties? Like, this is so corny. I was the first, I was like, this is, who cares? Like, nobody cares. But then, like, I'm like the biggest fan of the solar eclipse. I saw now. you out there borrowing people's glasses. Glasses, trying to yeah. Get yeah. <laughs> well, you was at the yeah. park. You were out there, wherever you were at. You I were really, I really was. I accidentally saw, seriously, Bridget said it was so beautiful. Literally, God's beautiful work. It was like, I mean, if you've ever questioned before, once you saw the eclipse, you were like, this is nothing but God. This is crazy. Okay. So we got to so, wait like a year, right? Like, I think there's another eclipse happening in March of next year. I don't know if it's a full Oh, I thought it was eclipse. like 10 or 20 years. I don't know. For, yeah. What was, what was yesterday? It was, it's going to be a while. Dang. We really 44 years or something like that before it'll happen again. 44 yeah, years. It's going like to be that. crazy. Okay. So we have been talking about branding and marketing. We've been talking about interest rates. We've been talking about a lot of things. I really want us to drop some nuggets really fast and leave something tangible for our audience on today and talk about boundaries. Because one of the things that we struggle with the most as women, especially, is boundaries. So I wanted to take the time and go around and have everyone tell something that they've done, whether you're applying it right now or not, that can help somebody that's watching us help set help them set boundaries. Because think about it, we're balancing family, career, a lot of you all, kids trying to have a little bit of a social life and sometimes there seems to not be enough time in the day so I'll kick it off I remember and I because I keep telling myself ah, I need to do this again back in 2021 I stole this from Michelle Obama literally before the new year started it was at the end of 2020 going into 2021 I, I went to my calendar before I even got booked for anything and I marked off two weekends a month that's how determined I was and I put booked so if someone called me whether it was friends family opportunities I could literally look at my calendar and tell whoever it was sorry I'm booked because I needed to prioritize some me time at that time that was probably um because I was still really busy working during you know that was during COVID I was still really busy however it really truly helped me to like create space for myself. I felt the best I had ever felt and then I haven't done it since. So I struggle with boundaries. So I would love to know what you ladies do. Um, Patty, you were mentioning earlier that you have a friend that her husband knows from 11 to four, don't come in here. That's a boundary. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? She literally set that, side, that time aside. That's for her work. But how do you all create boundaries and what do those, really look like for you all nasima do you want to go first then we can work Heck back? no because i'm so bad with boundaries. <laughs> i'm like dang i thought it was just me i was trying to get out of that <laughs> okay um okay or I'll maybe you don't do it now what would you like your boundaries to look like yeah um yeah all right this is gonna sound kind of crazy so today literally today this is a super on-time question and i'm going to try to keep my emotions and check with it because today was one of those days I said oh my god like everybody needs me today my phone has been going 
crazy. And it's just one of those days. And I think for me, the hard part is feeling like, why it's not even that I, I don't mind that people ask me for things. I don't mind that people find me to be a resource. I'd love, I think that's great. I like being a dependable friend and resource for people. That's fine. For me, it, I didn't like leave me alone. That's how I felt today because the, the, it's the mental load, the mental tax that comes with having to think for people. And so it was the fact that so many people were reaching out to me today. It was the fact that I was on certain meetings and I'm like, why am I having to think for people? Why do I have to keep taking this on? And so one of the things that I have been practicing and this, I mean, last two ish to three months, I have been almost like kicking myself because I'm like, why didn't I do this sooner? And I don't know if it's necessarily it. the boundary is I, I'm not doing it. Can, can you do this for me? Can I do this? Can I, can I spend time? Can no, the answer is just, you know, no, I can't, but I've got somebody who can help you. And so I've done a much better job with, um, delegating, expanding my team. A couple of my teammates are on here right now. I got to big, give big shout out to Bridget Oliver in the comments. Bridget. Oh my gosh. This girl has helped me free up my mind in ways that have allowed me to do so much more. So I guess long and the short is I'm, I'm learning how to say no. I'm also learning how to delegate. And what that has actually helped me realize is that one, I should have done it sooner. So if you're having a hard time delegating and being a control freak, don't be like me. Okay. Don't be a control freak. Realize that you can actually help enable someone to become better. You know, stop robbing people the op of the opportunity to not only one help you, but learn, right? To be better, to, uh, nurture skills and develop skills and when we take on things just because it's easier right like sometimes i've always been that person like you know it's just easier if i just do it stop being that person yeah because then you got to keep doing it right mm -hmm. take the extra time teach uh delegate and that's that's my spiel man delegate do it sooner man don't be one of these crazy business owners who have to have their hand in everything i've been that for too long and i have literally exhausted myself so there's that's that. good I mean, um, I saw this video on Instagram and it was a mom and two daughters trying to take a picture together. And the youngest, the eldest daughter kept putting her hand and gripping the youngest daughter's arm. And the theme was about boundaries. And the little girl just kept looking at her sister and said, don't do that. Like, don't touch me. And she just kept doing it. And eventually the photo shoot fell apart and the mom was really frustrated. But the lesson in the photo was, why don't you understand my boundary? right? And how this is instilled from childhood, right? So like if you were told to sit, even if you were posing for a picture and you're in an uncomfortable setting, you're always told to compromise something that makes you happy and prioritizes your safety or comfort, even at a fundamental survival level for the sake of others, for the sake of the photo, for the sake of what mom wanted, for because sister wanted to put her hand on me in the photo. So I think it's something that we have to really sit privately with and think a little bit deeper on go deeper in maybe a meditative or a prayerful state to understand why is it that I'm willing to compromise when something makes me uncomfortable? So Kelani is describing a very standard day for an entrepreneur, for someone who's building community, who's constantly needed and tugged and pulled from different directions. Well, simply in a scarcity mindset where you feel like you have to respond to everybody and you have to create a solution for everybody and you feel that if you don't you lose value that's an issue that's the deeper issue right so or we say hey i want to in this setting i'd like to create a boundary that after a phone call that i have i need a, i need to recharge i need to look at the sun I need to sit for a minute. So I'm going to block my calendar after every longer call or a meeting like this for at least 30 minutes. I can't compromise that because those 30 minute breaks just enable me to recharge. Whether I run downstairs to grab some water, step outside and take a walk, go to my meditation rug and sit down and just think, right? There's something that you have to do within the middle of your day in between calls and in between high stress or highly energetic moments to be able to recuperate some of your energy. And then I think the theme needs to be, let me check in with myself and say, what is it about me? What did I experience as a young person that created a habit within me that at every time I someone asks me to do something that I don't want to do, that I say yes anyway, 
right? Because all of this whole talk about boundary setting is kind of newer um, in terms of being popular through lots of different great psychologists that share this information about how healthy boundaries are so important, you know, and that shows up in the form of communications with partners, friends, business associates, how you handle your business, how you manage your calendar. And I think the deeper thought is to really sit with yourself and say, what is it about you that feels that you have to compromise something you don't feel comfortable with in order to appease somebody else, even if that means giving up an opportunity. And then I think it becomes easier to set some of those boundaries and say, hey, like a solution to what Kalani I thought would be would be, hey, after after a wire meeting, after a big Zoom call, you're highly pumped, you're on, you're performing, you've got 30 people watching you, you've got 50 people checking in with questions, take a 30 minute break, everything goes off, even the light sometimes, and just recharge check back in with yourself and be able to kind of re-energize to go to the next thing. Um, something I've been, that has been something that I'm implementing. Actually, I'm in my home office because when I'm at work, I, I, for eight hours, I don't even drink water. I'm sitting there and I'm so focused and I'm like, that's not healthy for this fitness journey that I'm on or for this mental journey that I'm on. So I like to be home because now I've gone down twice today and I've prepared healthy meals twice today. I'm hydrated. I had my collagen. I did my things. These are my boundaries. That 15 minutes in between longer phone calls enables me. So that's what I'm implementing. That's what I saw. And I do think that in my journey, I've learned it's a deeper question of that stems from childhood. Like, why am I doing things that I'm uncomfortable with to make someone else happy? And I think for me, it's like really listening to my body. And sometimes that's a little bit hard. So I've uh, had to implement some technology around it. Like I just got this, I don't know, my hand is weird. Uh, like this ring, right? And it tells you like your readiness score at the beginning of the day. And like really listening to that because I um, have been known to just push through to the point of burnout and I don't want to get there, especially with three kids. If something were to happen to me, like, <laughs> like who would take care of these kids? And so I really have to um, listen to myself and be okay with not going so hard on certain days. So the boundaries are more internal. Um, the boundaries are um, to make sure I am the best me I can be so that I can show up for the other people in my life. That's so good. I, I, I wanted I wanted to say, if you don't mind real fast, uh, yeah. Kehlani, it's so Go funny um, when Patty talks about getting to the root of the issue. Um, what I've been noticing about myself and my inability to set boundaries oftentimes mm -hmm. is because, dang, this is really hard to say, but I have to question myself. I'm like, maybe I don't trust God like I claim I do right? Mm -hmm. Like it mm -hmm. sounds great. And I want to, I have the desire to, but I am so busy trying to make everything happen that I don't even give him space to do his thing. Right. It's like, if I don't take this meeting, if I don't show up, if I don't say yes. And then oftentimes when we are saying yes to other people, it's because sometimes you just want to keep the peace and you're afraid maybe that you, you may lose people sometimes, but it's like saying yes to everybody else what happened to the peace within you right and so all of that for me is a faith thing for me you know what i mean like she said say no to the opportunity and it's like well dang if i say no to the opportunity you know i'm gonna miss out on this money yeah but do i trust god to provide for me i say he provides for me right do do i trust him like or if i say uh, no to this person what if they get mad or whatever but is this person even supposed to be in my life maybe god has been trying to cut them away you get what i'm saying so for me it's a constant I have to just learn to lean in more and learn mm -hmm. to release because the only way that he can show out is if I move out, if I get my hand off the, off the driver's wheel, you know? Yeah. One, you know, I want to respond to that because I, I'm an overachiever, right? And they, they say that overachieving is actually a, a trauma response. Yeah, um, I'm comfortable enough in my journey to share my testimony about, about this. And, um, the, I, had a very deep rooted father issue that I didn't realize that I, I, I think probably both of my parents in some regard, right? So both of my parents as um, they are amazing. I just want to say this, my mom and dad love you guys. You guys are amazing. I have the best relationship with both of my parents. This is not a knock on them. This is that parents are imperfect, right? And although they do the best that they can, we still inherit um, trauma because of various different things. 
And I had, I was always an overachiever because I was my mom's only kid and she wanted the best for me, wanted me to do so great. And then my dad was emotionally unavailable. Right. And, you know, and he, he had, they both came from very abusive, hard childhoods. Right. So they were give, pouring into me to make me the best that I could be, to give me everything that they never had. Right. And so there's a lot of pressure that came with that. And so I always showed up and performed. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm air quoting performed, not that I'm not being genuine and authentic in who I am, but in the idea that I never gave myself room to have a bad day, to be in a bad mood. I had to show up. I had to make sure I, I, I did everything right. If I do everything right, my dad will be, you know, pleased and I'll, you know, whatever. And, and so that has, I've grown up and that has manifested in my life in a way where it's like, I'm always, now I'm in the habit of showing up and not wanting to disappoint. And that is a trauma response. So I had to address in therapy and shout out to my spiritual account, my, my, my therapist and my guidance counselor who also helps me. She is the best and she helped me get to the root of that problem. And so I started to show up in that way. And, and, and so I had to do that inner work. And then I also had to, to your point, Jade, have faith in, um, a, a, just a, another word to the wise, right? The Lord said he's not a liar. And he says that my a yoke is easy and my burdens are light. And if it is, God is not the author of confusion. And if you are feeling that, then you're not in alignment. We are not in alignment somewhere. And we are, we owe it to ourselves to sit and be still long enough to get centered, to be able to hear the voice from God and the message from God that we are intended to hear. So Lady Jade, I I can identify with you on every level right then, right there. I'm on that same exact journey myself. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. Hugs, everybody. That's what she said. Okay. That's what she said. <laughs> that is what she said. All right, ladies. We are, oh man, we're two minutes over the hour. Well, well, that's good because we started a little bit, a little bit late. Thank you all for tuning in again. You guys have made this such a memorable day. Um, we'll start and go backwards. In this, oh, wait. Sorry. Thank you for the All comments. Of us. I see you, Harley. Thank you for the comments, everybody. And uh, I think that John, that was a very sweet comment. Thank you for that. We really appreciate your stamp of approval on the show, being retired, successful, and being that you've reflected on life. Thank you for that. That meant a lot. Thanks for that comment. Absolutely, 100%. And we've all drank water at some point on the show today. So any well, water sponsors, any product placement sponsors for the show, get at us. You can message That's What She Said. The inbox is open. Period. Hey, period. Um, but Nasima, um, where can the people find you? All right. I'm everywhere at Financially Intentional, Financially Intentional Podcast. Hang out on Instagram. Get at me. Mm -hmm. uh, you can follow me on social media, actually Instagram at I am Lady Jade. I don't even remember what my TikTok or any of the rest of them are. I got to figure <laughs> out my Facebook login because I can't remember, but I am Lady Jade on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm Patty Goodspeed, P-A-D-I, and Goodspeed, not Godspeed, but Godspeed is a part of my life. Okay, so Patty Goodspeed on all platforms. Um, thank you so much. I had a great time today, and Jade, that really touched me. I'm going to have to send you a message after the show today about that abundance and what you're tapping into the vastness capacity of God and how that's going to keep showing up. That meant a lot. Thank you for sharing that vulnerability today. Thanks, sis. Aww. And I'm Kaylani Blackwell uh, at Kaylani B on all platforms. Um, it's Kaylani B on TikTok. And uh, real quick, I want to shout out again my wire ladies in the comments. But um, Nicole P, she is a wire member. She's been heavy in the comments. She's got a show called Sh uh, Share the Wealth Podcast. Great for anybody looking to get into multifamily or the investment side um, of you know multifamily and adding to their portfolio. Thanks for holding it down. Thanks to Stephanie. Um, Jeffrey, Berger, Latoya, all my wire members holding it down. You guys are awesome. Um, and I think that's about it, ladies. That's what she said. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.